Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, host of Relationship and Truth. And in this video I'm going to be interacting with the comments, or specifically one comment, well, and some of the preceding material, but I'm going to be interacting with a self-professed pagan by the name of Timothy Curry. Now, the basic reason for why I'm doing this is because I am a conservative Reformed Christian, and I believe that all of mankind, myself included, in and of our natural selves, are rebels against the throne of the one true and only God. And because of that, we are all worthy of being placed in the lake of eternal fire. But I also believe that God has made a way for those who will repent and believe to escape this just punishment. And I believe thoroughly and completely that one cannot have confidence of salvation from this due punishment unless they repent and believe. And I want Timothy to repent and believe. I want him to be able to have that confidence as I do. I believe that the eternal lake of fire is a real place that God will send the wicked, that God will send the rebellious, that God will send those whom he does not pardon, who are justly condemned before his holy, perfect throne. And so Timothy and I have been kind of going back and forth here. And the conversation is at a point where I think that there is some benefit uh, from interacting with it in this way for people who are outside of this conversation. For people who are, say, my fellow conservative Reformed Christians, I think they'll be able to gain and glean a little bit from this conversation. From people who are within Protestantism but would differ with conservative reform Christians on some issues such as uh, pretty much any of my synergistic friends, whether they be old school Arminian, new school Arminian, um, Southern Baptist traditionalist, whatever the case happens to be, any of my synergistic friends I think are going to um, hopefully be challenged by some of the things that we're going to talk about here. And then of course there are other people out there who are like Timothy, who are self-professed pagans, who happen to hold some of the same beliefs that he does. And I think that a lot of what we're going to do here is going to challenge them as well. Now, to give you guys a little bit of background on this conversation, Timothy is responding to a repost of one of my posts. I had originally posted a meme that was on the topic of people murdering their unborn children, which is colloquially called abortion, which is just fancy terminology for I want to have the right to murder my own kids. And of course, the meme that I put out was not for murdering your own kids, of course, because conservative, reformed Christians are very much so against murdering your own kids, regardless of age or stage or level of development. Okay. So I put out this meme. And one of my online friends, my, one of my online Facebook friends by the name of Jared, reposts it. And Timothy gets on there and he cannot help but comment on it. And so Jared and I uh, start interacting with Timothy. And before we get to this particular comment that's on the screen here, Timothy, because he's a self-professed uh, pagan, and I was talking to him about absolutes. How do you know that you're actually right and that we're wrong? What's your ultimate standard? Do you have one? Can you justify saying that this particular belief system is right or wrong, etc.? And Timothy's response was basically to take all religions and throw them under the bus and basically say, well, we know that men make mistakes, Every religion has that has ever existed or ever will exist is filtered through men in some way, shape, or form. Therefore, every religion is fallible, so I don't claim to be absolutely right. And it's 
what I, one of the things that I've talked about uh, before on this channel and in other places is that we live in an age of what you might call profound epistemological agnosticism. We live in an age where it is the vogue thing to say, well, I don't know if I'm right or wrong. And this is the loving and accepting thing to do, you know. I'm really sure that you guys who are, you know, against murdering unborn children, I'm sure that you guys are wrong about that. But, you know, when pushed on it, do you have an absolute standard? Can you actually justify what you believe in an absolute way and in, in some ultimate sense? Well, you know, mankind's not perfect, and so we can't really know anything. And of course, I, as a conservative Reformed Christian, hear that, and I'm thinking, you know what? You have a very different idea of how things work than I do. You are presupposing that man's fallible nature, that man's errancy, not inerrancy, but man's errancy, his capacity and proneness to do what is wrong, is something that the one true and only God cannot overcome. You are assuming that God cannot supersede and oversee fallible men in such a way as to both perfectly inspire and sufficiently preserve his word to us. And so that's what I told Timothy. You're presuming, in order to make the claim that you are, you're preserving and uh, presuming that God isn't really all-powerful, that God can't do what he says he's done. The Bible is full of places where God gives a word, and the word is taken as being sufficiently preserved. For example, by the time we get to Jesus, and of course from the initial revelations of Scripture given to Moses to the time of Jesus, is a good 1,500 years or so, and yet Jesus takes this word from that was originally given to Moses all that time back, and he uses it to rebut the Pharisees and the Sadducees. His, one of his classic lines that he uses repeatedly is, Have you not read? It is written. And this is the same thing that he even reuses to rebuke Satan. It is written. And Jesus quotes scripture to Satan. Even when Satan tries to quote scripture to him, Jesus goes right back to that foundation. What was perfectly inspired and sufficiently preserved is what Jesus goes with. That is the testimony of scripture. And for anyone out there who calls themselves a conservative biblical Christian at all, whether you're reformed or whether you're a synergist, every single one of them um, that has any kind of claim to biblical Christianity at all would have to believe in biblical inerrancy. But I find my synergistic friends uh, to be rather befuddling on that matter because they claim that the Bible is indeed sufficiently preserved, perfectly inspired, and fallible inerrant. And yet they don't believe, and Timothy, you're going to uh, find this out, there are different branches of theology within Christianity, of course, and you already know about some of this, um, that there are different branches of theology. I'm just expounding one particular difference that shows up in this context, that there are people who claim to be Christians out there who will say, yeah, the Bible is the word of God, completely truthful and trustworthy. And yet at the same time, we'll say that man uh, is such that he has a free will before God, that he is not, that um, God is not autonomous to do whatever he wants, that man's will will interfere with what God is trying to accomplish. They'll hold both things which are fundamentally contradictory. Reformed Christians, though, like myself, we don't hold that position. We hold the biblical position that God really is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And if he has decided that he is going to do something, he's going to do it. And the will of man is not going to interfere. So that's what I said. And then this is how Mr. Timothy responds to that. And this is the, the current comment that we're on here. He says, okay, so you believe man cannot override God's will. And if Timothy is talking about the God that I'm talking about, that G should be capitalized. But yes, uh, conservative, reformed 
biblical Christians believe that man cannot override God's will. That is a perfect summary of what we believe. And then Timothy attempts to take that one step further. He says, so that means your God wants little children to bed repped, raped, sorry. I think he means be raped and murdered, as long as it's not in the womb, because we're talking about abortion here, about murdering your own child. He goes on to say, your God should be capital G. And I think that's supposed to be wanted the elderly, elderly to be attacked and robbed. Your God wants people to, I think it's supposed to be, to be hungry and homeless. This is obviously very emotional writing, because he's missing things. Uh, and I get the same way too. If I'm doing things maybe a little quicker than I should, I'll start combining things and missing words. We all do it. Um, because people committing these acts have no free will. That's not really a sentence. I mean, if he can prevent men from changing religious texts, then by all that is holy, he can stop a man from raping, I think it's supposed to be a three-year-old. Correct. Okay, so that's the first paragraph of his current response to me. And ironically, even though the, Timothy claims to be a pagan here, it's really interesting to hear him respond with basically the same objections that uh, my Arminian and synergistic friends put forward. It's really interesting that they wind up on the same side of the aisle on this one. But getting back to actually responding to Timothy here, you correctly summarize the belief of conservative Reformed Christians. We do, in fact, believe that man cannot override God's will. That is true. And then you say, so that means your God wants little children to be uh, raped and murdered as long as it is not in the womb. Well, and this is where you're making the mistake of assuming that basically everything uh, that the Bible reveals about God and mankind is entirely one-dimensional. Okay, to back up a little bit here, and this is something that we've discussed, maybe not in extensive detail before, but we have discussed, is that, excuse me here, allergies are bothering me just a little bit, uh, but we've discussed the fact that in the biblical worldview, the Bible declares all mankind to be sinners before, before a holy, righteous God. Okay, what does it say in Romans 3, for example? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there are no exceptions on that one, except for that which the Bible itself accepts. Um, Jesus Christ, who is the God-man, is the only one who has ever had a truly human nature, who has been perfect and sinless. Aside from him, no, we're all sinners. And so what we have here in this world right now is a world full of sinners, that by the testimony of the Bible deserve, and it would be perfectly just for God to do this, for God to put them immediately into the lake of eternal fire. That would be perfectly good and just of God to do. We are all, by nature, rebels before the throne. And instead of putting us directly into the lake of eternal fire, he has instead put us in a penal colony the earth as we know it, the post-fall earth, after Adam and Eve rebelled in the garden. That is what earth is in a conservative, reformed Christian worldview. It is a penal colony, and everyone in it, including myself, is a criminal before the throne of the God of gods and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And here's a shocking revelation for you, Timothy, and also for a lot of my synergistic friends and other people out there in general. Criminals and those who are sovereign over them are not under the same constraints. You see, those who are sovereign over the criminals, the king, God in this scenario, he gets to do what he wants with them, punish them as he sees fit, because it's his law that they broke, and he gets to determine the punishments for it. He gets to determine what happens to them. However, 
That does not mean that the criminals get to treat each other however they see fit. There's a difference. Okay, They're not under the same constraints. And you, of course, know this. Take any prison, for example. You're going to have a time when it's lights out for the criminals. The guards, of course, are not going to go to sleep when it's lights out. Just saying. Okay, God is not under the same constraints that we are. And so we're dealing with criminals. And if God chooses to allow certain criminals to undergo certain temporal punishments, that's his business. However, that doesn't mean that he hasn't given us mandates by which we are to live, okay, which we would call the declared will of God. This is how you criminals are supposed to interact with each other. And there's various things that the Bible has to say about that particular issue. And God rules and overrules in all things. Yes, there are people who are going to disobey his declarations. But even that isn't outside of God's control. It's not outside of God's will. Okay, God controls the ends and the means. And he uses disobedient people to accomplish his ends and obedient people to accomplish his ends. And no one can question him justly because we're all criminals. Okay? We don't have a leg to stand on in his court. So if he decides to use criminals to punish other criminals, that's his prerogative. Not ours, but that's his prerogative. And the interaction occurs in time. We make decisions as we go along. We make real decisions as things go along. But God still orchestrates everything. Go back... Uh, to the, the Bible here. you did, yeah. Well, actually, let's kind of springboard to the Bible from your initial comment here. You say, so that means your God wants little children to be raped and murdered as long as it's not in the womb. Okay, again, the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, those little children are sinners too. Which comes as a surprise to some people who haven't very clearly read the Bible, but they're sinners too, just as much as under the wrath of God as anyone else. And so if he wants to allow them to be raped and murdered, that's his prerogative, not ours. The him as the sovereign, that's his prerogative. The guards get to stay up even when it's lights out for the criminals. It might be bedtime for little Susie, but mommy and daddy get to stay up. A sovereign and a subject are not under the same constraints. But this issue of terrible thing happening to someone and God wanting it to happen, well, that's exactly what happens in the Bible. Take the case of Joseph, for example. In case you don't know, Timothy, Timothy has, for, for the rest of you guys watching this, Timothy has claimed to be an ordained minister. He doesn't seem to know a whole lot about the Bible in some respects, but then again, there's quite a few people who claim to be ordained ministers who don't seem to know a whole lot about the Bible either. Um, but uh, for those of you who don't know, whether or not that includes Timothy, I, I don't know. But for those of you who don't know, uh, Joseph in the book of Genesis is a very interesting person. Uh, he's one of the, the patriarchs and um, one of the, the leaders, of, well, one of the, the heads of the, the 12 tribes of Israel, that is. And in the course of his life, he undergoes some pretty brutal things. At first, he receives visions from God about what is going to happen in the future. And he receives revelation that at some point in his life that all of his brothers are going to bow to him. And um, his brothers think he's being a little hot-headed and, and cocky, and they decide that they don't like him very much. And initially, they want to kill him, um, but they don't wind up killing him. Instead, they wind up selling him into slavery. And as a slave, Joseph manages to do pretty well, but at one point in that process, he is accused, falsely accused, of being a rapist, which he wasn't, but he is accused of being a rapist, and he's treated like one, and he is sent to prison. 
And so he's sold as a slave. He's accused of being a rapist. He spends time in jail as a criminal. And at the end of all of it, Joseph does eventually wind up on top. He winds up becoming second in command in Egypt, second only to, only to the Pharaoh. And his family <laughs> does, in fact, wind up bowing before him. Um, and when Joseph talks about this event, when he's talking to his brothers who are now very fearful because of what they did to him, he responds to them by saying, what you meant, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And it's the same word in the underlying Hebrew, and I think also in the Greek if you're talking about the Septuagint. Same underlying word. What you meant for evil. And Joseph makes no bones about the fact that it was indeed evil what his brothers did to him. Selling him into slavery. Um, the fact that he was falsely accused of being a rapist, that he spent time in prison for a crime he never committed. Yeah, that was all bad. It was all evil. But he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Same word. What you meant, what God meant. Same action, and yet they have real intent involved in it, and God has real intent involved in it. That's how the Bible puts things. It is a system of belief called compatibilism. That's the fancy term for it now, but it's present all the way back from the very beginning of the Bible. That everything that happens in human events is ordered of God. And God uses people who are doing wrong things, and God uses people who are doing right things to accomplish his goals in all scenarios. Now, that doesn't mean that he doesn't judge them according to what they meant to do. They meant to do evil which means that what they did was wrong. But it still accomplished God's purpose. Okay, God's purpose still comes out. What he has decreed would happen, happened. What he has declared right and wrong, though, they violated, and they will be judged for that. Now, that might seem like a bit of a problem to you. Well, if that's what God decreed would happen, if he meant this, for good, if he actually wanted this particular thing to happen, then why are they judged for it? It's because they're willful in it. Okay, take the just a, as a an example. You know, let's say there is a man whose car malfunctions. And this is a man who loves to speed on the highway, and his car malfunctions, and uh, the car starts speeding on its own, and he's enjoying every second of it. And eventually a cop notices him, pulls him over, and uh, confronts him about his speeding. And he says, well, officer, my car was broken. I couldn't help but speed. And let's say this cop actually knows this guy pretty well. He's had a few interactions with him. And so he asks him, did you like what you were doing? Did you like breaking the law? And the man says, yes, I enjoyed every second of it. If that cop is a good cop, he's going to smack him with a fine. One for having a car that's in bad disrepair, but also for an attitude of rebellion. Okay. The cop is going to see that this, even though it's inevitable disobedience, it's still willful disobedience. It's still wrong. And that is the way that God treats us. Will God use our evil proclivities for his own purposes? Yes, but it doesn't make them any less evil. What God has declared is what we're judged by. And yes, God works them all out. So God allowed even someone who was at least situationally, not uh, who was situationally innocent, not to say that Joseph was perfect, he's not innocent in that sense, but he's situationally innocent of ever being a rapist. Okay, he didn't do anything that in and of itself would merit being sold into slavery, being accused of being a rapist, or going to prison for a crime he never committed. But God allowed every single one of those things to happen, condemning the people who did it to him along the way, and then using this person for his own purposes, to accomplish his goals. What you this is what Joseph says. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. And Joseph never says, and never draws attention to himself as being anything great in this. 
he realizes that it could have been another way. He could have stayed in that prison cell and rotted to the rest uh, for the rest of his life. And it would have been perfectly okay for God to do so because he realizes his own state before God. And when he comes before his brothers, he's not saying, well, I'm the chosen instrument of God. No, he's actually quite humble because he realizes that had God decided to work it out a different way, it would have indeed turned out a different way. That there is nothing that was innately better about him than his brothers. And it's the same way that all conservative reformed Christians look at their fellow man. We're all just as evil as the other. The only difference is what God chooses to do with us. So we try to deal with each other as graciously as we can. And the reason why I'm still talking to you about the fact that you need to repent and believe. Hey, your God uh, wants or wanted the elderly to be attacked and robbed. Again, the Bible talks about these kinds of uh, things. You know, your God wants people to be hungry and homeless. Well, take the case of Moses, for example. Moses is commanded by God to go into Egypt and confront Pharaoh to let God's people go. And one of the objections that Moses raises is, he says, you know, I'm... I'm not really good at the whole public speaking thing. I've I've got some I've got some speech problems, God. And God's response to Moses is really interesting. He doesn't say, "Well, you know, that was something that was out of my control, but I still want you." No, he doesn't say that. He says, "Who made man's mouth? Who is it that makes man mute or speaking? Who is it that makes him blind or deaf or seeing or hearing? Who made man's mouth?" God takes full responsibility for Moses' speech problems and says, yeah, I did it, and I can overcome it because I'm the one who created it. This is entirely within the realm of the biblical God. The biblical God claims to be in full control of all things, the good and the bad that happens to us. Take Job, for example. He had terrible things happen to him. And Job understands who God is, and one of his responses to what's happening to him is to praise God. This causes some people to be rather curious, and he says, should we not accept evil from the Lord as well as good? He understood that God is has the right over him, that he is the creature, God is the creator, and he gets to do whatever he wants with his creatures. That's God being God. That's God being sovereign. Now, this doesn't mean that Job didn't have his questions. Of course he did. But there is a fundamental truth that is revealed there. Both the evil and good of our lives both have the same source. They both come from God. That God intends, not just allows, but intends for his purposes. That's what we see in the life of Joseph. That's what we see with Moses' speech problem. God uses it for his own glory. Yeah, you can't speak very well, but I'm still going to use you, and people are going to know it's not you, it's instead me, because you're kind of like a doofus. You don't speak so good, and yet you're still going to accomplish my will nonetheless. Job, he freely admits that the evil that befalls him is God's doing, just as much as the good is. Hey, these people have a profound awareness of their own unholiness before God. Okay, and it doesn't matter who you are. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you're not God, and you're a person of any remarkable in any remarkable sense, you're a sinner. And God is not obligated to treat any sinner well. The fact you're alive instead of being sent immediately into the lake of eternal fire is an act of grace that you and I don't deserve. God is omnibenevolent. He gives us far more grace than we deserve. None of us deserve to be alive, according to the Bible. And yet he still allows us to live. And when we intend to do evil things, 
There's a lot of times, and I would argue the vast majority of times, that he restrains people from doing the evil that they intend to do. Take the case of Abraham and his wife Sarah. They, uh, at one point in their journeys, uh, wind up within the territory of King Abimelech. And King Abimelech sees Sarah, says, hey, she's cute. I'm going to take her for my wife. And he does. But Abimelech never gets to consummate the marriage. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to have intimate relations with another man's wife. Um, now, at the time, he didn't know that she was another man's wife, but he still wanted to do it nonetheless. It's still sin. He still wanted to do what was evil in God's sight. And God restrained him from doing so. And God even tells Abimelech, I kept you from laying a hand on her. He doesn't say, oh, you were such a great moral guy, you you held off. No. It's not, I kept you from laying a hand on her. You intended to do evil. I didn't allow you to do it. And that is the right of a sovereign versus a subject. <clears throat> the sovereign God can withhold, can restrain the evil that we would want to do to each other. A lot of people ask, you know, why there's so much evil in the world? Well, from a, a biblical Christian point of view, it's a pretty easy answer. It's because we're all evil, wicked people. The real question is, why isn't there more evil in the world? Because the Bible is real clear. We're all sinners before God. We're all totally depraved. We are fundamentally and innately totally wicked. And if it wasn't for the restraining hand of God, this world would be a lot worse than it is. You talk about, you know, a three-year-old being raped. If God's hand of restraint wasn't upon the earth in so many ways at so many times, that wouldn't be an odd occurrence. That would be the norm from a biblical worldview. But God still allows it to happen sometimes. Why? Well, first of all, that's his prerogative. Okay, and that's exactly what the Bible teaches. Take Romans chapter 9, for example. We'll just go ahead and read that real quick here. Not the whole entire chapter, of course, because that would take a while. But one particular section of Romans 9 that is indeed applicable. Starting in verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he, referring to God, why does he still find fault? For no one can resist his will. Turns out, Timothy, you're not the first one to object to the biblical God in this way. For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to the molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Romans 9, verses 19 through 23. Your objection, Timothy, is not new. Christians have been dealing with it from the very beginning. Well, if God's really in total control, then how could he possibly find have fault with anyone? Why doesn't he intervene? Why doesn't he do this, that, or the other thing? And the answer is real simple. Who are you, old man, to answer back to God? You're a pot. He's the potter. The pot doesn't have the right to rebuke the potter. It's a pot. That's the Bible's response to you, Timothy. And to my synergistic friends out there, my old-school Arminian friends, new-school Arminian friends, Southern Baptist traditionalists, all those sort, same response that God gives you, too. Um, I love my Arminian brothers and sisters, but on that particular issue, the Bible says this, and they go off into left field. The Bible says, yeah, God controls everything, and that you don't have the right to question him because you're a pot. And they say, no, I do have the right to question God. No, God really wouldn't violate my free will. And then the Bible says, you don't have a free will. You're a pot. It's interesting that the self-professed uh, self pagan, Timothy, and Arminians wind up on the exact same 
uh, plain when it comes to this particular issue. So, is the God who is capable of perfectly inspiring and sufficiently preserving his word capable of stopping a child from being raped? Yep. Does that mean that he is obligated to? Nope. Because criminals don't have rights. Okay, the sovereign cannot be held accountable by the subjects, much less can the judge be held accountable by the criminal. The potter receives no objections from the pot. He will not entertain them. The pot can kick and scream and all it wants, but it's still a pot. And if the potter decides to take that pot and make it into, say, a chamber pot, where Blink goes, he can do that. Or he can take from the same lump of clay and mold it and make it into a beautiful vase to put flowers in. And the potter has every right to do that. And frankly, Timothy, as well as a lot of my synergistic friends who are out there, until you understand that concept, I admit, yeah, this is none of this is going to make sense. The idea that God is truly sovereign, that he is not subject to any standard outside of himself, is a hard thing for a lot of people to grasp because they want to be able to control God. They want to be able to tell him what he should have done and what is moral and what isn't. Problem, though, is that God isn't terribly concerned with what is moral and what isn't according to our standards. He doesn't live according to our standards. We have to live according to his, but he does not have to live according to ours. It is not a two-way street. The God of the Bible does not institute a democracy. It is pure and an unadulterated despotism in the purest sense. God's will is sovereign. Yours isn't. Hey. If God really is who he claims to be, he isn't obligated to you, and he's not obligated to me. We all, you and I, stand condemned before the holy righteous king. We're all innately, in and of ourselves, rebels. And you keep demonstrating that every chance you get. You keep finding objections after objections after objections, reasons to hate God. Every single reason you can put forward to hate God, you bring forward. You demonstrate time and time again, you are a rebel by nature. And frankly, so am I. The only difference is that God has convicted me of my rebellion, and he hasn't done that to you yet. And I just pray that you repent before it's too late, because you will face him one day, and you will face him either as the criminal, the rebellious, criminal that you now are, or you will face him as a criminal who's been pardoned and who has realized that pardon in coming to repentance and faith. All right, so first objection was, well, if God's in control of everything, why doesn't he do all these things that I want him to do? Simple. He doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't care what you uh, think he should do. You're a criminal in his sight. He's not going to bow to your whims. Okay, he gets to do what he wants with his own things, and he has given us commands to live under. And he is not under those same commands. If he wants to put someone to death, he can. That's the right of the executioner. If he wants to allow someone to be raped, that's his right as well. That is the right of the punisher. We're criminals, though. We don't have those same rights. And we will be judged according to what stipulations were put on us. Not what God did or didn't do. All right, second paragraph. Also, how can you speak on my religious beliefs when you don't even know them? This is a very strange paragraph. This entire paragraph is going to be a very strange paragraph. Um, so far in the conversation, Timothy has identified himself as a pagan. He has spoken of believing in multiple gods. And everything that I've said to him regarding his beliefs has been with regard to things that he has already stated about his beliefs. 
Okay, he's already said that he's a pagan. He's already said that he believes in multiple gods. I said, if that's your point of view, you can't justify any absolutes because you believe in multiple gods. There is no absolutes. There is no single ultimate source for anything in your worldview. There are no ultimates whatsoever, and he's already basically agreed to that. Well, every religion comes to man, and man is fallible, blah, 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 blah. Doesn't believe in a sovereign God at all. So everything that I've said to him with regard to his religion has just simply been in response to things he's already declared. But what he's saying here, it makes it sound like I've somehow misrepresented him. But he's not going to bring up a specific instance where I actually misrepresented him. He's just making the accusation. And this is something that a lot of people do. You know, and we hear it today in, in politics all the time. You're misrepresenting me, blah, 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 blah. Well, if you can't cite a specific instance where the misrepresentation actually occurred, it's not really misrepresentation. It's just that you don't actually like being accountable to your beliefs. So I've already put it out there that there are no absolutes in a pagan worldview, that Timothy does not have any leg to stand on when it comes to issues of morality and right and wrong because he doesn't have a basis for it, at least none that he's provided, and he's not going to actually give a specific instance where I have misrepresented him, so it's a useless claim. He goes on and says, And I get that you do not understand, but my religious beliefs cause me to protect people if, and if I do not agree with them. Then catch this next line here. I believe abortion is the right of the host mother. So he says, my religious beliefs cause me to protect people, but I believe abortion is the right of the host mother. So I protect people, but I don't protect unborn children. Okay, Timothy has kind of been implicitly asking this all along, but he's going to wind up explicitly asking it in this comment. You know, how do you know, Mr. Christian, that your worldview is true? And my response to that is always very simple. Because any other worldview winds up being, winds up having the problem of contradiction, either external contradiction or internal contradiction, but contradiction of one form or another. And here's a classic example of it. My religious beliefs make me want to protect people, except for the people who actually need my protection the most, like unborn children. That's a blatant contradiction. A blatant internal contradiction. I want to protect people, but not really. Now, you will notice here that he says abortion is the right of the host uh, mother. And this is because Mr. Timothy is of the opinion that um, the unborn baby, until it's actually born, is a parasite. And therefore, because it's a parasite, it's not really a person. And again, this is one of those instances where people who don't have a biblical worldview always wind up in this morass of self-contradictions of one form or another. Either internally or externally, they wind up with a bunch of contradictions in what they happen to say and what they happen to believe. So he's been arguing, you know, a baby does not have any human rights or any human dignity because until it's born, it is just a parasite. Well, I wonder how consistent um, Mr. Timothy would be in the case of, say, conjoined twins. In the case where one of the, the twins is born, de uh, born defective such that it doesn't have uh, some of its own internal organs instead, it relies on its twin for some of those vital functions. In the case where one twin, for example, doesn't have a working stomach of its own, it can't actually... Um, digest any food. It can't actually eat anything. It gets all of its nutrients from what its twin eats. His or her twin. That conjoined twin, who is quite literally living inside of the body of his or her twin, is a parasite. Isn't he or she? Granted, this parasite is a human, but does that mean that since it's a parasite that the other twin who has all of the functioning organs 
can look over at his or her conjoined twin, pick up a rock and smash him in the face, killing him, because, hey, he's a parasite, he's a drag on me, my body, my choice. Is that what you would argue, Mr. Timothy? That in the case of conjoined twins, where one twin is dependent on the other, where one is a parasite of the other, that the other now has the right to kill that other twin? Okay, if you were to be consistent, you would have to say yes. And I'm afraid that you just might be consistent on that. But if you do say yes on that, it reveals really clearly that you actually don't want to protect people. What you're more interested in is convenience. Hey, this conjoined twin of mine is getting in the way. My body, my choice. If you're really consistent with that line of reasoning, what you've revealed is that you're actually a very selfish person and you support selfishness in other people. Hey, you don't want to protect people. You want convenience. But of course, then this next couple of lines that you put here, you know, I believe abortion is the right of the host mother. Because he believes that, you know, babies are, are parasites, which is also the case with conjoined twins that are dependent on their twin. Although he hasn't argued that he would, that you could just arbitrarily kill them. It's her body. It's her choice. Well, the same thing with the, the twin who has all the functioning organs. It's my body. It's my choice. I don't want you to be dependent on my body anymore. Rock to the head. But of course, these statements in and of themselves are just laughably untrue. It's her body? No, it's not her body. Okay? The human that is in her womb is a distinct human being. It has its own genetic code and everything. From the moment that the egg is fertilized, it is its own unique individual being. Okay, it is a scientifically laughable lie to say that it's her body. It is not her body. It is a completely different body. It's her choice? Well, not in God's courtroom. No, it's not her choice. God will hold her accountable for murdering the child that he gave her. He's going to take that very seriously. But what does Mr. Timothy believe? It's a parasite. It doesn't have rights until it magically exits the birth canal. And on that point, I wanted to play a relevant video. Human rights. You may think you've always had yours, but you would be wrong. So how did you get your human rights? From the magical birth canal, of course. Disclaimer, birth canal is not the size of an actual birth canal. Just saying. Before the baby or fetus is born, it is not a human being. Clearly. But as it passes through the birth canal, something amazing happens that transforms it into a person. With human rights. Observe. Not a person. Not a person. Not a person. Coming out the other end. A person! Human rights! Congratulations! You now have value. Can't say the same for this one. So what exactly happens in the birth canal that causes this magical transformation? No one knows. But popular scientific theories include fairies, aliens, or a cork, a mini Big Bang. I think it's fairies. No human rights? Human rights. No human rights? Human rights. Makes sense. Thanks, magical birth canal. Science. Logic. Magic. Human rights. What if it's a C-section? I love good satire. But yeah, it's rather ridiculous to say that because the unborn baby is somehow dependent, that it somehow doesn't, it isn't human in some sense. It's utterly ridiculous. And by the way, no, I do not have owned the copyright to that particular video. I will not be making any money off the sale or redistribution of that video, so on and so forth. All the pertinent disclaimers apply. But Timothy's uh, 
supposition that because it's somehow dependent that it makes it somehow not human is just utterly ridiculous on every level. But suddenly when it's born, then it has rights. I'm just wondering, does that apply to conjoined twins, where one twin doesn't have all the vital organs and therefore is parasitic relative to the other? I'm just wondering. Inquiring minds want to know. So he says, I believe abortion is the right of the host mother. It's her body, which it isn't. It's her choice. Well, if it is, then it's also my choice to go around and arbitrarily kill anyone who's inconvenient to me, because that's at the end of the day what you're really arguing for. My beliefs on the matter does not matter. That is such an ironic statement. He says, I believe abortion is the right of the host mother. Then he follows it up with a couple more beliefs. It's her body. That's his belief. It's her choice. That's his belief. And then he has the audacity to say, my beliefs don't matter. I couldn't make this up if I tried, folks. Hey, people, again, they ask me, why are you a conservative, reformed, biblical Christian? And my response is always the same, because every other worldview, when you press on it hard enough, it implodes. He contradicts himself throughout this paragraph so many times. He accuses me, basically, of misrepresenting his religious beliefs without ever citing any evidence that I've actually misrepresented his religious beliefs. And then he says that my beliefs make me want to protect people while he's arguing that unborn babies shouldn't be protected. Then he says, these are my beliefs. And because of these beliefs, I can say that my beliefs on the matter don't matter. These are my beliefs and therefore my beliefs don't. Yeah, I, like I said, I couldn't make this up if I tried, folks. Then he says, same with you. I believe you have the right to your faith. I would fight for you to worship your God, even if I do not agree with your beliefs. They are, use, uh, are yours, and you should have that right. Timothy, no, I don't believe you. Okay, if you really were a live and let live kind of person, when you saw that abortion meme, you wouldn't have said anything. The fact of the matter is, you don't believe that I should have the right to worship my God as my icy fit. Because me worshiping my God includes upholding his declared law. And his declared law says, thou shalt not murder. Which means I am actually going to want to protect people, including unborn children. Which, ironically, you don't seem to understand the contradiction in your own statement there. And it means that I'm going to be an advocate for that. And it also means that I'm going to obey God's commandments to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, meaning that I'm going to go around preaching to people, telling them to repent and believe. And you, at the end of this comment, will ask me not to tell you to repent and believe. But guess what, Timothy? That is a part of my religion. That is a part of my worship. Do you still feel like defending my right to worship my God? I don't think you do. You can say that you're a live and let live kind of guy, but your actions speak a whole lot louder than your words at this point. If you really believe that, you would have left this conversation a long time ago. And for those of you who are curious, this conversation has many, 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 many replies throughout the entire thing. Let's see here. At least 64 replies. Does this seem like what a live and let live kind of guy would do? I don't think he can let live here. I don't think he would really advocate that we should have the right to worship as we see fit. And frankly, I don't believe that he should have the right to worship as he sees fit either. At least I'm honest enough to say that. I believe that he should worship as God demands that he worship as the true God, the only God, the one true only God demands that he should worship. The difference is I'm actually consistent with my belief system and I actually say what I mean and I mean what I say. Timothy, on the other hand, he says, you know what? They are yours and you should have that right. You should be able to worship your God. But when I worship my God by following my God's commandments to command people to repent and believe, 
and to protect the lives of those who cannot defend themselves, then suddenly I'm the bad guy. He's not a live and let live kind of guy. He'd like to believe he is, but he's not. Then he goes on to say, you speak of human life and dignity, but the right to defend yourself. Those two things are not antithetical. Just saying, why does your God not step in and keep a true believer safe? Well, he has done that in the past. If you remember the account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, when the pagan king decided that these people who didn't really fit his understanding of things should be killed, minimally opposed, but should be killed by throwing them in a fiery furnace, uh, God did intervene on their behalf. So he does do that from time to time, but as I've said before, all mankind, even those who repent and believe, are still, in and of themselves, criminals before the Holy God, and he's not obligated to save them. And what was Shadrach, Meshach's, and Abednego's response when the king said, I'm going to throw you in the furnace? He said, our God is capable of saving us, but if not, we're still not going to do what you want us to do. Those three words, but if not. Of course, that's the English translation. But three very profound words. What are they saying? It's saying that God isn't obligated to save us in any way, because we're criminals just like you. But we're not going to let go of our repentance and belief, because it is only from thence that we have any confidence of pardon before the only God who matters. Why would we fear someone who can kill the body when we believe that we're going to be facing the one who can destroy the body and soul in hell? God is not owe me anything. Okay, I truly believe that God is sovereign, that I really am a pot and he really is a potter and that I don't have any rights before him. Okay, he gets to do as he sees fit. Okay, and if he wants to save me, that's his prerogative. And if not, that's also his prerogative. You go on and you say, no one can go against his will, correct? Very true. You're right. So that is exactly what was discussed, say, well, there's many places that discuss it. But let's talk about Daniel. Chapter 4. This is what the king Nebuchadnezzar learned. Starting in verse 34, it says, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among it, the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? You're right. That is exactly what the Bible teaches. God does his will even among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can go against his will. You are absolutely correct on that one, Timothy. That is exactly what scripture teaches. However, the next bit of logic here is just absolutely astounding because it's not logical. So you say, so if someone tries to kill you, then it's his will and you have no right to intervene. No, that doesn't follow at all. What the Bible teaches is that God declares, gives declarations to us, commands to us, and that we are to live in light of them. And that God's sovereign decree is lived out in the decisions that we make day to day. And so in light of those decrees which include the right of self-defense of individuals, of groups, of nations even. In light of those decrees, we make decisions, and as those decisions are made, God's decree comes to fruition. What you're trying to do is squish it all down and make it one-dimensional, but the Bible is not one-dimensional when it talks about how God's will interacts with man's will. Reformed people do believe that man has a will, but it's not a sovereign will. It's not an autonomous will. It is always a will that is under the power of God. We make real decisions in real time. And how those decisions are put together are what combine 
for the achievement of God's decrees. Okay. doesn't mean that you have no right to intervene, though the Bible says very much so the opposite, that you do indeed have a right to intervene and even a responsibility to intervene, depending on the situation. Okay. The Bible gives protections for people who are in self-defense situations. The Bible talks about what to, ha and to do when people behave unjustly towards each other, that there is indeed to be an intervention and there is uh, supposed to be justice, so on and so forth. You're trying to squish it all down and make it one-dimensional, which is exactly what a lot of my synergistic friends try to do. My um, old-school Armenian friends, new-school Armenian friends, Southern Baptist traditionalists, all of them try to do the same thing and say, well, if God decrees the ends, that means that anything that is happening at any given moment is something that you don't have a right to intervene in. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God uses all of the different aspects that are at play. Both the other person's will and your own will are both subject to God such that the combination thereof will result in God's decree. But you still have the obligation before God to act in accordance with his decrees, which does include the right to self-defense. Okay, and that is historically where some of the uh, biggest issues, especially in, in Western history, happened, is because Christians believed in the right to self-defense uh, against oppressive governments, acted on that belief, and attained their freedom thereby. And those were people who were also conservative Reformed Christians in some cases, such as John Knox and, and, form, and folks like that. Um, they believed that God ordains the ends as well as the means, and one of the means that God uses is his people obeying his commands, who are living in accordance with his word rather than in defiance of it. The decree of God is exceptionally complex. Okay, your supposition that if someone tries to kill you, it must be the will of God that they kill you, does not take into account the full complexity of everything that God has in play. God is decreeing their intentions, but he's also decreeing mine. And he's decreeing that I live in accordance with his declared will. And it's that interaction that produces the decrees of God. Going back to the instance of Joseph and his brothers. His, jo his brothers sold him into slavery. He was falsely accused by a fellow by the name of Potiphar's wife of being a rapist. He was imprisoned, so on and so forth. Terrible things happened to him, but eventually he winds up becoming second in command of Egypt, second only to the Pharaoh. There is the evil intentions of his brothers, but there's also interventions that happens with his brothers as well, because if you remember when I originally told the story, I revealed that his brothers initially wanted to kill him, but they didn't. Instead, they wound up sold, selling him into slavery. There was one of the brothers who said, no, we shouldn't kill him, who decided to protest on the basis of God's declared will that human life is indeed valuable, which, by the way, happened back in uh, Genesis. Well, you can go back all the way to the beginning if you want to, uh, but one of the more overt places where it happens is in Genesis uh, chapters 8 and 9. Uh, that talk about the value of human life and our responsibilities regarding it. And so one of Joseph's brothers actually acts in accordance with God's declared will and the interaction between the brothers who want to kill Joseph and the brother who wants to act in accordance with the declaration that human life is to be preserved winds up forming the basis on which Joseph is sold into slavery. And that leads to the rest of the series of events that results in uh, what God decreed that would be achieved, that Joseph would indeed be in a position such that his family would bow, bow down to him, and many lives would be saved through what Joseph endured. What happens in the context of God's will is very complex in the Bible. And you keep trying to squish it down, which is the exact same error that my Arminian and 
just in general synergistic friends try to make. They don't let the Bible speak in its fullness. To say that there are many things that are interacting that wind up forming the final outcome that God directs. And that one of those things is God's declared will that his people act in accordance with. And those who are not his people act in defiance thereof. And God uses both of them for his purposes and his ends and his means. All of it. It's not just one simple thing. You can't squish that down to just one dimension. Hey, the world we live in is amazingly complex because God made it complex. And that's what the Bible reveals, is that all of these people have their own intentions that they're trying to accomplish. And yet he still intercedes and supersedes in all things. It reveals a very complex working in God. And so if you try to squish it down, you're ignoring the testimony itself. Nice try, but you can only do that in ignorance of what the Bible actually presents in full. That there is so much more interaction than you can just fit into a single dimension's line of reasoning. Again, this is a self-professed pagan, folks, and he's offering the exact same kind of objections that the synergists do, that the old school Armenians do, new school Armenians, Southern Baptist traditionalists, all those folks. He's reasoning the exact same way that they do, in contradistinction to the fullness of what Scripture reveals. That God really is in control, that he doesn't owe us anything, that the judge is not accountable to the criminal, criminals, because we're all criminals in God's sight, and that the way that God accomplishes his decrees are very complex and they involve his people living in accordance with his decrees and those who are not his people living in defiance thereof. Okay. If you tr ignore those things which scripture very plainly re reveals, you wind up with these very simplistic, very trite, very useless kinds of objections. Well, your God isn't nice is essentially what Mr. Timothy has been saying here. Well, your God allows little children to be raped. Yeah, and that's what the Bible says is appropriate because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, I really believe what the Bible says. The objection that Mr. Timothy raises isn't a biblical objection. It is a personal distaste for what the Bible teaches. But it's not a biblical objection. Same thing with saying, well, if God has put it in someone's heart for them to do a particular thing, we just have to let them do it. No, that ignores that God uses the interaction of various people's wills to accomplish his decree. And that he uses his declarations positively in his people, negatively in those who are not his people. Okay, These are all very simplistic objections that have absolutely nothing to do with what Scripture actually says. They are in profound ignorance of what Scripture actually says. Okay, but getting back to you, Mr. Timothy. Okay, like I said, that's a gross oversimplification. Moving on to the next paragraph. Also, you speak of historical biblical Christians. Actually, I don't. I speak of biblical historical Christians. Not that it's a huge point of difference, but as long as we're being picky about things, I mean, you can say, you speak on my religious beliefs when you don't even know them, and yet I've never actually said anything about your religious beliefs other than what you revealed. But hey, we'll, we'll be picky for the sake of being picky. You go on and say, but there is no historical proof of many stories in the Bible. What do you mean by historical proof? Have you examined your presuppositions on this one? Are you saying independent, corroborating evidence? Are you saying that something cannot be historically true unless there's independent, corroborating evidence? Because if that is your standard, that is basically a standard of guilty until proven innocent. I'm not going to believe this as being true unless there's this additional proof that it's true. If you were to treat any other historical document this way, most of what we would call history you would have to throw out. 
take a lot of their early Greco-Roman history that we have. A lot of it comes from singular sources. Take Tacitus, for example. There's some things in Roman history that we know only through Tacitus and no one else. No one else talks about these things. It's just from Tacitus' works that we have some parts of Greco-Roman history. Because there's not independent corroborating evidence, does that mean that what he said must be false? Are you really willing to be consistent across the board here? Or would you actually take the stand that um, most historians throughout history have taken that says that a historical document is taken as being true unless there is evidence to the contrary? And that evidence to the contrary has to prove itself beyond a reasonable doubt. See, that's what people who are actually concerned with justice and treating sources fairly do. And that's how the American system of justice actually developed, was actually on those kinds of principles, which, by the way, are actually very much so based in Christianity as well, that says that you don't assume that someone is guilty simply because you don't agree with everything that they happen to say. And even if you have evidence that disproves someone, you understand that that proof has to be of a sufficient level. It has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. There are standards when you try to um, impugn either a person's character, the character of the person who wrote the particular historical document, or of a religion. Okay. Would you be willing to be consistent with this level of skepticism with everything else in history? I don't think you would. I don't think that most of it you would even pay any attention to. I don't think most of it you're really even aware of, as most people aren't. Most of us don't know everything there is to know about history. And most of us haven't given a whole lot of thought to where our knowledge of history actually comes from. Because the requirement that you have here is that there, you say there's no historical proof of many stories of the Bible. Taken as it's said in that sentence, what it seems to be requiring is corroborating evidence. Like I said, that doesn't exist for Tacitus and a lot of the other Greco-Roman historians. Does that mean that they're automatically lying just because we can't corroborate what they were saying? That's guilty until proven innocent, not innocent until proven guilty. And then, if you think that there is evidence to the contrary, which might also be what you're trying to get at here but not stating very well, are you sure that that evidence against is of a sufficient nature to say that against a reasonable doubt you can put this forward as being disproven? Because I'm pretty sure that if you were to get into it and talk about the particular accounts that you're concerned about, I don't think that a reasonable treatment, um, a reasonable judicial treatment, would bear out what you're saying. Because what you seem to be doing is assuming guilty until proven innocent, and you're assuming that any kind of counter-evidence, regardless of its relative weight and merit, is sufficient to disprove what you want to see disproven. Okay, You are presuppositionally against biblical historical Christianity, whether you want to admit it or not. And the way that you frame this particular statement reveals that. Okay, you couldn't be fair to biblical historical Christianity if you wanted to. You have blinders on, man. You are stuck on the premise that Christianity is wrong, whether you see it or not. You are stuck with the presupposition that Christianity must be false. Whether or not you can see it, it's clear to everyone else exactly what you're doing here. Then you go on and you say, the historical truths of Christianity is paved with torture, hate, violence, murder, rape, and so on. And I've discussed this before. You're assuming that everything in history that calls itself Christian is really Christian. I've discussed this before. And the Bible discusses this. It says that Jesus himself says that there will be those who call me Lord, who say to me, Lord, Lord. And I will say to them, away from me, you workers of iniquity. Are there people in history who have called themselves Christians who have done terrible things? Yes. No freaking duh. 
Does that mean that they were actually Christians according to the standards of God's word, though? Nope. Because God's word gives specific de declarations against things like rape. For example, in the Bible, rape is a crime that is punishable by murder. Murder is also a crime punishable by murder in the Bible. It's very, very, very clear that these people who do these kinds of things are not truly Christians. Now, one thing that I did want to point out here that is not against Christianity, that Christians are allowed, in fact, to do, and frankly you do as well, is hate. Hate isn't a bad thing. A lot of people think that it is, but it isn't. Hate is just the opposite side of the coin of love. You cannot say that you love something unless you hate its opposite. I cannot say that I love God without hating that which is opposed to him. You cannot say that you love justice in the world, and you cannot say that you love women's rights without hating that which opposes it, which is the reason why you jumped on to this particular repost and just felt that you had to comment. It's because, in this particular case, I really do believe that you love what you say you love, which is reproductive rights, the right to murder my own child if it suits me. That's ultimately what it is. You love that. You love the right to murder, and because of that, you're going to hate everyone who opposes you. You hate too. You might not want to call it hate, but you hate too. And frankly, if you love anything with any kind of real love, you are going to really hate its opposite. Otherwise, you don't really love what you say you love. And it's the same thing with us as Christians. If we say that we really love God, and we really love his commands as revealed in the Bible, then guess what? We're going to act like it. And that means that we are, in fact, going to oppose that which stands against it. And that includes people who want to murder unborn children. Does this mean that I hate you on a personal level? No, I told you the reason why I'm confronting you in the first place is because, in fact, I do love you. In the sense that you are a fellow criminal before God, you are just as much under God's wrath as I am, and I don't want to see that wrath come to fruition in you. But that, at the same time, does not mean for a second that I'm going to let up on God's commands. Because I understand that it's by God's commands that we are condemned. It's that which stands against us. I cannot consistently proclaim to you the righteousness of God's commands without also confronting the unrighteousness in your love of murder. That would be a very inconsistent thing for me to do. And it's the same thing with you. If you really love the right to murder unborn children, you're going to hate in some way, shape, or form, maybe not necessarily me personally in a sense that you want to, you know, come and duke it out with me or something like that, but enough to oppose it, certainly, which is why you jumped on the, the repost and you just had to comment, you're going to hate the opposite. You're going to respond. You're going to try to dissuade people from it which is the whole reason why we're having this conversation, is because we love the things that we say we love, at least to a certain extent. You, um, There's things that you say that I frankly don't believe. When you say that you believe in my right to worship uh, my God as I see fit, I don't believe that for a second. Because every time I worship my God as I see fit, by commanding you to repent and believe as God commands us to repent and believe, you get mad at me. And you might not say that you're really mad at me, but you get mad at me. You're not responding by saying, oh, thank you. No, you're responding in opposition. Okay, and like I said, it might not be to the point where you want to duke it out, but you're responding in opposition. You're mad at me because I'm opposing you. And frankly, I'm not exactly super thrilled about the <laughs> things you say either. I am mad at you in that sense. I hate that which opposes the true God, and you oppose the true God. Now, does that mean that I want to duke it out with you? No, I still fully recognize my place before God. I am a criminal before him just as much as you are, and aside from the grace of God, neither of us has any hope. But God has promised that everyone who repents and believes, he will pardon. And that is an invitation that is open to you, Timothy. Whether you want it or not, it is still open. And while you live, there is still time to make use 
of that opportunity. It is a promise on God's part. He has promised that all of those who come to him in true repentance and true faith will indeed reap the benefits thereof. But in order to do that, you're going to have to let go of yourself as the standard. And in interacting with you, it's very clear that you put forward yourself as the standard. There are two kinds of religious people, to simplify things way down, regarding their religions. There are those who are syncretistic regarding their religion, and those who are submissive regarding their religions. A syncretistic person is a person who incorporates aspects of a religious system based on their own preferences. They say, these are my standards, and if this happens to meet with my standards, I'll incorporate it. They really are acting as their own God. They're saying, this is right or wrong according to me, and if this thing out here happens to match that, then okay, it's fine. And then there are people who are submissive regarding their religion. They say, what is right or wrong to me does not matter. It's this other thing that determines what is right and wrong. This religion that determines what is right and what is wrong, and I am subject to that. And interacting with you, Timothy, it's become very clear that you are syncretistic. You're not submissive. You say that you're a pagan, but you also say that your moral and ethical beliefs don't come from your religion. That means that your religion doesn't actually really guide you in any meaningful way. What you have is you guiding yourself and calling yourself a pagan, saying that you believe in these other gods, but when in fact what you're really doing is you are using yourself as the standard. And frankly, if you found out something about the, the gods that you claim to believe in that you didn't like, you probably wouldn't believe it. Because you put your own personal preferences above your religion. I, on the other hand, not that I do this perfectly, but I strive to be submissive regarding my religion. Meaning I don't reserve the right of judgment because I don't believe that God can be judged by me. More importantly, because the God of the Bible says that he will not be judged by me. He says that he's the potter and that I'm the clay. And I submit to his authority. I don't have the right to determine what is right and what is wrong. I don't have the right to determine morality and ethics for myself. That is solely in the purview of the one true and only God. And that, at its very core, is the biggest difference between you and I. When it comes right down to it, you believe that you're God. You might say that you believe in gods, but when it comes right down to it, you're the final arbiter of what is right and what is wrong in your system. You don't believe in gods except as a nice way of masking what you really believe. What you really believe in is yourself. And the only reason why you claim to be pagan at all is because it happens to match what you have already decided is true. You are not just an idolater. You are a self-idolater. And that is a very serious crime before the one true God. He says, yes, not to make any graven images, not to have any other gods before him. And he makes it really clear that we're the pot, he's the potter. What kind of defiance do you have to have in your heart to say that you have the right to determine morality and ethics before the one true God? A very hard, very stubborn heart. And that should terrify you. Now, in the last sentence of this paragraph, you say, So what proof do you have that makes your beliefs absolute over everyone else's? And I've said this multiple times going through this. The reason why I'm a biblical historical Christian at the end of the day is very simple. Every other worldview implodes on itself. It contradicts itself. And you've done that here. I believe in protecting people except unborn children. 
I believe that it's her body, although I've also said that it's a parasite that isn't her body. Every false worldview out there is going to be typified as being false by its contradictions, either internal or external. And that is exactly what you've done regarding your worldview, Timothy. Whether you want to admit it or not, you have contradicted yourself. You've shown that your belief system, whatever it is, is self-contradictory. And that is the difference between my belief system and yours. Okay. Now, does that mean that there aren't objections that people raise regarding biblical, historical Christianity, conservative, reformed Christianity? Of course there are. But there are satisfactory answers to them. And you, so far, haven't given satisfactory answers regarding the contradictions in your own system. You don't even have a system that can provide a basis for any kind of absolutes. You, so far, have claimed to be a pagan with multiple gods. You've admitted a belief in multiple gods. Your system doesn't have any absolutes. In fact, you've always, <laughs> in these responses, consistently disavowed absolutes. So why on earth are you concerned about absolutes in the first place? If you really believe that there are no absolutes, that your conversation and my conversation doesn't have any bearing on truth whatsoever, you would have left this conversation a long time ago. But the fact of the matter is, you are God's creature living in God's creation, and because of that, you are being constantly driven back to truth, to an absolute, ultimate reality, whether you like to be or not. You believe in ultimates. You believe in absolutes. You really do believe in truth, even though you've tried to disavow such. You're innately self-contradictory. And that is how I know that Christianity, that biblical, historical, conservative, reformed Christianity is true. Because without it, I am reduced to absurdity. I would be reduced to reasoning like you, full of self-contradictions. And then the final paragraph, which I talked about, you say, and once again, I have no need to repent, so please stop asking me to. With all due respect, Timothy, you do need to repent, because the one true and only God who is sovereign of this universe has said that you do. What is it that Romans 3 says? For all have sinned and fall short of the kingdom of God. And what was Jesus' very own message that we see in, what is that, Matthew 4, 17, I think it is? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You're going to have to stand before that king, and he has given you an explicit command to repent, and he will hold you accountable for such. And he has said that you have a need to repent because you are a rebel in his sight. Timothy, I'm going to keep responding to you because I believe that God can work on even the hardest of hearts. That God really is sovereign. And I really do love you as myself. If I was in your state, I would want someone to do the same for me. If I was really in danger, of the lake of eternal fire. And even if I didn't understand the problem, if I didn't believe that the problem existed, I would want a real friend to keep confronting me with the truth until I breathe my last breath. Eternity is not something you can mess around with. And I really do believe and the true sovereign God, before whom I am a criminal, before whom you are a criminal, and that there is only one means of assurance of pardon, and that is repentance and faith. I thank you very much for your time and attention if you've listened to this, and I hope that it has given you a lot to think about, as well as my other online friends, it's given them much to think about as well. For those of you who are in Christ, go with God and be blessed. For those of you who are not, I pray that you would come to an understanding of the one true Christ of history, the only genuine Savior of mankind. Amen.